Good morning and welcome to week 12 of online Sunday school class from First United Methodist Church in Henrietta, Texas. Today's lesson is being videoed in our chapel once again and Patrick and I are so excited about being back in the church building uh, today as we started out this series in the chapel and then we had to transition to uh, doing this from my home. Uh, nevertheless, we're, we're glad to be back uh, in the building. I need to let you know some exciting news. And that is that we will have worship this Sunday, June 14th at 1035 in this very building. Uh, we will not have Sunday school yet. That is on further down the road, probably, and we will be abiding by some uh, guidelines to keep our members and our visitors uh, safe uh, during this time, but we will have worship here this Sunday. So uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, on Sunday morning, June 14th. So that's exciting as we transition back into our routine of worship here uh, at First United Methodist. Now, as I said, it, may, it will be a while before we are actually back in the chapel together as a class uh, to study God's word together. But uh, as Patrick and, and I have uh, plow through these uh, guidelines, uh, we promise to still do a Sunday school online for those of you who want to uh, participate in that manner. Um, our lesson today is from the Old Testament and concerns actually a mountaintop experience. Um, it's not a, a what you would call a, an entirely positive experience. Uh, it is fraught with controversy and uh, lots of people, does that sound familiar? <laughs> um, but it, it concerns uh, actually a duel between a prophet and a king. Now our lesson title today is Fire on the Mountain. Um, our lesson focus, as uh, you saw at the beginning, uh, is a, a light, it's a candle, and then there's a basket alongside of it. Um, it's supposed to portray a bushel basket. I don't think it's actually a bushel, uh, but uh, keep that in mind as we go into God's Word this morning and study together. I need to give you a bit of background uh, before we read our scripture today. Israel was in dire social and economic need. Sound familiar again? Social and economic need. God sent the prophet Elijah to announce to the northern kingdom that a drought would come upon the land. The land would see what is described as neither dew nor rain for three years. Now, we as residents of North Central Texas are quite familiar with the term drought. And having gone through a five-year drought, now we can connect with what these people were going through. Now, God instructed the prophet Elijah to go and tell King Ahab that the Lord would now send rain once again. Good news. But it wasn't received so well by King Ahab. You would think that he would have been very happy with this prediction and this reassurance of God's care. Their meeting was anything but cordial, however. Elijah 
was also there to denounce evil that had come to plague the land. And this evil was in the form of idolatry, especially idolatrous worship that had been endorsed by King Ahab. Elijah had said to the king, you deserted the Lord's commands and followed the Baals in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 18. Now, uh, King Ahab was not very happy about this public indictment of his leadership. He gathered all the people of Israel along with 450 prophets of Baal. So this is the lineup. On the one hand, we've got the prophet Elijah of the one and true God versus 450 prophets of Baal led by King Ahab. So we've got a, a social uh, type thing. We've got a religious type thing. We've got a governmental type thing going on here as well. And there's much tension in the air as you might imagine. Let me direct your attention now to the scripture for today. It's in the book of 1 Kings in the Old Testament, chapter 18, verses 20 through 39. It's, it's an extensive uh, reading this morning, but um, it's a great story. It will hold your attention, I'm convinced. Starting with verse 20 of chapter 18 of 1 Kings, Ahab, now remember he was the king, sent the message to all the Israelites. He gathered the prophets at Mount Carmel. Elijah, he's the prophet of God, approached all the people and said, how long will you hobble back and forth between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow God. If Baal is God, Follow Baal. The people gave no answer. Well, let me direct your attention back to a key word in those first verses, and that word is hobble. When I began studying the lesson earlier this week, it drew my attention back to a shopping trip a few years back. Now, the shopping trip, I recall, it involved a good friend of mine, Jaquita Graves and myself, uh, being in a, a shoe store. And uh, we dared each other to try on some metallic gold three inch spike heels. That was not a good idea at all. <laughs> we were hobbling down the aisles of the DSW in Fort Worth. It wasn't a pretty sight and we did not buy those shoes, by the way. <laughs> Back to the scripture. Now, Elijah said to the people, I am the last of the Lord's prophets, but Baal's prophets number 450. Now just think of the difference in the numbers and the power of that sight with the people. Now he starts giving some instructions here. Give us two bulls. Let Baal's prophets choose one. Let them cut it apart and set it on the wood, but don't add fire. I'll prepare the other bull, put it on the wood, but don't add fire. Then all of you will call on the name of your God and I will come call upon the name of the Lord the God who answers with fire, that's the real God. Hmm. It's a showdown. All the people answered, that's an excellent idea. Hmm. How often do we uh, fall for those big shows? <laughs> you know, they wanted something spectacular. They were impressed. Um or with the, um, the idea. And sometimes it takes that much for us to get our attention fully undivided, doesn't it? 
So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of these bulls, prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but don't add fire. So they took one of the bulls that had been brought to them. They prepared it, called it on Baal's name from morning to midday. They said, great Baal, answer us. But there was no sound or answer. They performed a hopping dance around the altar that had been set up. Around noon, Elijah started making fun of them. Hmm. He's kind of heckling, if you will. Shout louder. Certainly he's a god. Perhaps he is lost in thought or wandering or traveling somewhere. Or maybe he's asleep and must wake up. So the prophets of Baal cried with a louder voice and cut themselves with swords and knives as was their custom. Their blood flowed all over them. As noon passed, they went crazy with their ritual until it was time for the evening offering. Still, there was no sound or answer, no response whatsoever. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here. All the people closed in and he repaired the Lord's altar that had been damaged. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the Lord's word came, your name will be Israel. He built the stones into an altar in the Lord's name and he dug a trench around the altar big enough to hold two seas of dry grain. Now, that amount would be equal in our measurements to about nine quarts. He put the wood in order, butchered the bull, placed the bull on the wood, filled four jars with water, and poured on the sacrifice and on the wood, he commanded, do it a second time, he said. So they did it a second time. Do it a third time. And so they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar and even the trench filled with water. At the time of the evening offering, the prophet Elijah drew near and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. I've done all these things at your instructions. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that this people will know that you, Lord, are the real God and that you can change their hearts. Then the Lord's fire fell. It consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the dust it even licked up the water in the trench. All the people saw this and fell on their faces. The Lord is the real God. The Lord is the real God, they exclaimed. You know, when God answered, there were no doubter, doubters at this scene. Everyone realized the power of God. There's a country western song by Aaron Tippin. Perhaps you're familiar with it. Uh, the title is, You've Got to Stand for Something or You'll Fall for Anything. That song title really is appropriate for this story in the Old Testament. You've got to know where your beliefs come from. You've got to know the God that you profess. You will be called upon to profess his name someday. And you better know sure where your God is and what he stands for. You know, the prophet Elijah was tired of them straddling the fence. They were hobbling back and forth. Do we believe in Baal? Do we believe in God? 
was Elijah a little bit cocky? I think he was. He had an attitude, but maybe it was because he had no doubt about who God was. He was that sure of himself. Now, there's a question for Christians today. How long will we hobble or will we truly stand up for God and what we know is right in his eyes? That's a question many of us have confronted in the last couple of weeks. Will we stand up for God and what we know is right in his eyes? Why do we hesitate to share our faith? Are we deep down unsure about our witness? Or is it because we don't want to offend anyone? Uh, we want to just play it safe. Listen to me. The awareness of God's redemptive love and presence working in our lives actually gives us a duty to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us to give the reason for the hope that we have. Could you explain your faith today? Could you explain to someone else who your God is and what he stands for? You know, in 1 Peter, there's a scripture that goes along with this idea, and, and I, I like the wording of it. But I should do this with gentleness and respect. We as Christians need to profess our God and our belief, but... At the same time, we do it with gentleness and respect. Respect for others of different persuasions does not call us to denounce or reject our faith. I'm grateful and I feel very blessed to be part of a denomination that does not put its go ye, therefore, under a bushel basket. Don't put your light under a bushel today. Share it with the world. Hope to see you soon.